November 13, 1974, South Shore, Long Island, New York. Six members of the DeFeo family are shot dead around 3 a.m. on Ocean Avenue. Mother, father, two sons, and two daughters. Surviving, the oldest child, 23-year-old Ronald DeFeo Jr. These tragic murders have long since been overshadowed by a family that moved into 112 Ocean Avenue after the DeFeos were brutally killed. The Lutz family, of whom none died. There are books, documentaries, more than one Hollywood movie, and tons of believers as well as skeptics about this home. On this week's episode, we're joined by psychic medium Katherine Kaufman, who is here to help us all unpack this tragedy and the fame that followed. This is The Real Amityville Horror. Hey y'all, I'm Chris Calvert. And I'm Katherine Kaufman, psychic medium. I am her husband, David Lee Hicks. And I'm her husband, Rob Hotworth. Welcome to Hitch to Homicide. For better or worse. Till death do us part. Welcome back, everybody. We've got a special show planned today. Wait because... a minute, wait a minute. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to steal your thunder. I got all excited. <laughs> I didn't even get to do a special welcome. You welcome. didn't, but you got your three welcomes in. I did. Go ahead. I know. We got a special, we've got a special show today. We've got Catherine Kaufman, psychic medium, and her amazing husband, who I think he's probably half psych- psychic medium just by relationship, <laughs> Absolutely. maybe. Through osmosis. Yeah, you know. Through osmosis. Yeah. Like, I can play a few instruments, but I'm not as good as Rob, and so I have a feeling that David has some psychic abilities just by hanging out with Catherine. It kind of rubs off I, Of course yeah. it does. <laughs> of course. Of course it does, but we are going to do the Amityville Horror today. I'm so... I've wanted to do this case for a really long time. I've done a ton of research. And, of course, you know, if I've done the research, you're going to hear about it, which means this is going to be part one. And then we're going to do a part two next week. Before we get started, wherever you're listening, like, rate, and review. That helps other people to find us. We're going to give you all kinds of information about Catherine. It'll be in the show notes, her website. But you can go to KatherineKaufman.com. She's got all kinds of interesting stuff in there. She's <laughs> She does a great show called the Monday Night Live Show. We will have a link to that in there as well. All kinds of really cool subjects that she covers. I like to tune in. Sometimes, you know, I catch it in the middle. Mm-hmm. But then I go back and I can watch from the beginning again. Because oh, even yeah. though you do it live, mm-hmm. I'm never on time anywhere I go. <laughs> right, Rob? <laughs> um, Day late and a dollar short. I learned early on that you never answer certain questions. Okay, so whatever. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Whatever. But she's going to help us unpack this crazy story. We're going to talk about the real Amityville horror because we're going to talk about the murders that happened first before we talk about the paranormal aspect of it. I do want to say before we get started, I have to give a special shout out. We have a super fan, a super fan listener, and Erica Griffith, it's your birthday today. It's your birthday. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. And your BFF Rachel sent me a note and said it's Erica's birthday, and I would love to make sure that she gets a shout out. And Rob is actually getting out a guitar right now for you, Erica. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Erica. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. That goes out to Erica all the way in Christchurch, New Zealand. Thank you, honey. Golf clap. That's what it's like when you're married to a musician. (laughs) There you go. That's it. That's it right there. Okay. I'm going to give you some sources. We're going to dive right in this. Catherine's going to stop me, interrupt me. Say whatever, <laughs> kick me, throw something across the room at me when she has some some information that I need to know, that we all need to know. Here I'll are, just interrupt. 
That's perfect. That's what we want. <laughs> okay. Let me thank some sources before we dive into this. True TV, AmityvilleMurders.com, HorrorObsessive.com, Oxygen.com, Newsday, The New York Daily News, True Crime Recaps, People Magazine, The Daily Mail, Newsday, The Night the DeFeos Died by Rick Osuna. Man, I, that sounds like a song. The <laughs> Night the DeFeos Died. I was thinking died. the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> the Night the so Died. Bye, I hope Rick doesn't bye. mind us like turning his book into a musical. <laughs> yeah. But I will have a I will have a link to his book in the show notes so you guys can go check it out. All right, let's do this. Ronald Joseph DeFeo Sr., also known as Big Ronnie, was born on November 16, 1930, to parents Rocco and Antoinette DeFeo in Brooklyn, New York. He was a good-looking guy. He was Italian. He was suave. How you doing? He's that guy. He was a joy. Mm-hmm. How you doing? Ronald's uncle, from some of the records I found, and I'm pretty sure this was true, he was a former capo in the Genovese crime family, and capo is short for caporegima, hmm. which means captain. So he's a made man in this crime family. Okay. Ronnie meets Louise Marie Brigante. Louise is born on November 3rd, 1931, to Michael and Angela Brigante. Louise was beautiful. She had aspirations of becoming a model. Big Ronnie and Louise fall in love, and when she wants to marry Ronnie, her father, who is a partner in a car dealership, Brigante Carl Buick in Brooklyn, he's not happy. Daddy's not a fan of Big Ronnie. Hmm. Mm. He wants more for his baby girl, but after these two have a brief courtship, they are married on September 26, 1951, and Louise's parents cut ties with the newlyweds. Oh, wow. Come on. Until. Until. Mm -hmm. That's right. Until little Ronald Joseph DeFeo Jr. is born. Ronnie and Louise call him Butch, but there were others who called him Ronnie. His dad was Big Ronnie and he was Little Ronnie. But I think Big Ronnie was also called Big Ronnie because he was a big guy. He he was a really big guy. Mm -hmm. Butch is the first born and a boy, and it's a big Italian family, and his father expected a lot out of his first male child. Oh, and that led to so much more. Oh, see? Mm. That's called foreshadowing (laughs) already. (laughs) Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, my gosh. We've got the dun, dun, dun's going already. Mm Mm-hmm. Ronnie was not an only child for very long. On July 29th, 1956, Louise gave birth to a daughter, Don Teresa DeFeo. A few years later, on August 16th, 1961, Louise and Big Ronnie welcome Allison Louise DeFeo into the world. And then again on September 4th, 1962, Mark Gregory DeFeo is born. Now, Big Ronnie's been working for his father-in-law as a service manager at the Buick dealership. So sometime between not wanting their daughter to marry Ronnie Mm. and the birth of four children, he goes to work for his father-in-law. Grandkids will do that to you. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. You think that's it? I don't know. I I think the more you learn about Big Ronnie, I don't know. Mm. I I don't know if he was really working at the dealership or not, but hang on. (laughs) After the birth of Mark, Louise leaves Big Ronnie, and the reason is never really clear, but I think he's an abusive guy, so you can put two and two together if ding, you want. Ding, ding, ding. All right, you there score. it is. girl. Big abuser. Yeah. So whatever the reason, Catherine's saying it was abuse, mm. she leaves. And to get his wife back, Big Ronnie decided to express his love for his wife and co-write a song for her called... The real thing. And in 1963, jazz great Joe Williams recorded the song for his album titled One is a Lonesome Number, which I thought was kind of telling. (laughs) Um, I have heard it and I will post it in the in-laws and outlaws group. It is up on YouTube so you can hear the song that he wrote for his wife. But these two reconcile. So I guess it worked. And on October 24th, 1965, Big Ronnie and Louise have a third son, John Matthew DeFeo. But just before John Matthew is born, the family moves from their Brooklyn apartment to Long Island. Specifically, they move to the South Shore community of Amityville, and Big Ronnie buys a home at 112 Ocean Avenue. Mm. Now, there are two accounts of this. One is that for many, it was it was a mystery how Big Ronnie could afford such a lavish home on a car dealer service manager salary. Right. And the answer, his father-in-law, Michael Brigante Sr., 
Yeah. Now, in other accounts, Ronnie Sr. had worked really hard at the dealership, and after many years, he had started to reap the rewards and the benefits, and money was no longer really a concern for him. How about no? And then the third <laughs> theory is that the mob, there was mob money involved. Well, yeah, I go for that, maybe. too. Yeah. yeah. I like the third theory. Yeah. yeah. The home they purchase at 112 Ocean Avenue is a large three-story Dutch colonial house built in 1924. It had several bedrooms, but the most distinguishable characteristic of 112 Ocean Avenue is... The windows. The, the windows. The eyeball windows. The eyeball windows. Oh yeah, God. that's exactly it. Yeah. Overlooking the street were two quarter moon windows that looked like eyes. Mm. But this is a feature that's common in Dutch colonial homes. Yes, it is. And I was just like, why? Why? Because the house looks angry. Yeah, it just doesn't look very homey. Yeah, yeah, and I always think, I think this about cars, too. I know I'm weird, <laughs> but I won't buy a car if I think the car looks angry. <laughs> you know, like the headlights, I'll like look at the front of it and I'll be like, that car looks angry. Like, I think, and I'm sorry if you drive a Tesla, I think the Tesla, he looks sleepy yeah. to me. <laughs> so yeah, It's like an angry elf. Yeah, I like, you know, I like some... What movie is that from? I look like a... Well, it's from (laughs) Elf. (laughs) Yeah, that's... Is that the the, uh, movie reference for the week? No, but we'll see. Okay. Well, but so, yeah, I think the house looks angry. Mm -hmm. And here's the history of the house. John and Catherine Moynihan built the Ocean Avenue house in 1924 and lived there very happily for many, many years until their descendants sold the home to Big Ronnie and Louise in 1965. The house had a pool and a boathouse. It sat on Amityville River. They named the house High Hopes. Mm -mm. And there was even a sign post in the front yard. And I wondered if it was from the song High Hopes by Frank Sinatra. Yeah, what year was this? Might have been. 1965. Oh, yeah. I'm sure it was. Yeah, and I just thought maybe that's what what I thought anyway. But behind the sign was a statue of St. Joseph holding the baby Jesus surrounded by three adoring angels. And I wrote in my notes, believe, That's creepy. believe me, this house is going to need Jesus. Yeah. I yes. mean, he's in the front yard and yeah. they're angels. And I thought maybe they, sh- they should have been a little closer to the house. Maybe. I don't know. But the interior of the DeFeo home was just as impressive as the exterior. To the right of the marble-covered foyer was the formal dining room. It had red, velvet-textured wallpaper. In the center of the room, over the Dutch-style table with seating for six, hung a big crystal chandelier. Across the foyer was the living room, which contained a baby grand piano. Fronting the large fireplace was a pair of white satin cushioned chairs, and lavish paintings and statues were scattered throughout the room. All the, the finest. All the finest. The DeFeos liked furnishing their home with extravagant things. Wow. Five years after they move in and around 1970, Big Ronnie decided he wanted life-size paintings of his family. Hmm. Oh. And apparently, <laughs> if you believe that, Big Ronnie's father-in-law, Michael Brigante Sr., paid for the house on Ocean Avenue. He also picked up the tab for the paintings, which was estimated to be at least, get this, $50,000. Oh, my wow. God. Back then, that's unbelievable. That's a lot of money. And I've seen these pictures. I gave one to you. Mm-hmm. That was one of the pictures that was painted. There, what, what would that cost be today? I didn't do that Probably calculation. close to... 51000 <laughs> 51000 <laughs> Right now it would be. <laughs> no, I mean, my from 1970... Oh, my gosh. It's probably a quarter million dollars. That's my guess. Mm. Yeah, let's see. I could look it up, but I usually do that, and I didn't do it on this one. That's a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle 23 on secondary market. (laughs) It (laughs) is Pappy Van Winkle. Very good reference. I love that. I love that. Very good. But these pictures are, they're kind of weird. And why not just one painting of the whole family? Because that's not what it is. It's like the girls and the boys. And the, it's very bizarre. But they're painstakingly detailed. And the portraits took over a year to complete. When they're done, the life-size portraits hang in large golden frames on the staircase wall between the first and second floors of the DeFeo home. That's kind of like French aristocracy. Well, I think they wanted to be, he wants to be way more than Mm -hmm. he is. Like the white satin chairs. Who has a white satin chair? Red velvet? No, Red velvet wallpaper? Oh, mama. Yeah, don't sit on my white satin chair. Exactly. (laughs) 
So in the house upstairs on the second floor were bedrooms, the master bedroom, the boys' room where Mark and John Matthew shared a room, and Allison's room. And then on the third floor, a finished attic and the rooms where the iconic windows are located are the bedrooms of the oldest daughter, Dawn, and the other one is Ronald Jr., Butch. And I'm just going to call him Butch from here on out just so we don't get him mixed up with anybody. Okay. It seems as though this crew is a happy family. All the kids are in Catholic parochial school. They go to mass. Big Ronnie works hard at the car dealership. Louise is a stay-at-home mom. And I even read that the children would recite the rosary every morning. Oh, wow. wow. Well, they would need to. Yes. Oh. And I thought about that, too. I'm like, what kind of demons are you keeping away if you have to recite the rosary every morning? But underneath all this success and happiness, Big Ronnie was a hot-tempered man, and Kat has already kind of alluded to that. Oh, yeah. And according to multiple sources, he had bouts of rage and violence. There were stormy fights between Ronnie and Louise, and he was the dad that everyone was afraid of. Mm. I channeled that he was abusive every single day. Wow. Every day. Mm. Wow. Wow. It, different people were targets on different days, but every single day somebody was a target. Okay, there it is. Big Ronnie was not afraid to discipline Butch in the cruelest of fashions. And growing up, Ronnie would be affectionate to little Butch one minute, and the next he would throw him across the room. Wow. Oh, yeah. Whoa. I So when I did the channeling for the show... I kind of went into the intricacies of DeFeo Jr., Butch, and some of the things that I got for that was that he was constantly abused by the father, and it was escalated. What I got in my channeling was that it escalated after they bought the property Mm -hmm. because DeFeo Sr. was off working at the car dealership, but... DeFeo Jr. or Butch was, he was expected to keep up all the property and everything about it. So I feel like when his dad got home and saw the least little thing out of that wasn't done, or maybe the grass was a quarter inch too high, uh, he would just get lamb blasted for it Mm. and just took everything out of the kid. Uh, No self-concept, no... Like an apathetic type of person. Well, Louise's brother, Michael, will say later that he witnessed Big Ronnie pushing a two-year-old Butch into the wall and banging his head when the little boy had done something that his dad didn't like. He was two. He was abusing him even at two. Yeah. And also when Butch is a little boy, he's overweight, and that's going to stay with him until he's a teenager. And Butch's school life suffered because of his weight problem. The bigger kids would make fun of him, calling him names like The Blob and Bucky Beaver and Pork Chop. And Big Ronnie told him to stick up for himself. But what he meant was stick up for yourself with the other kids, but not with me. Right. Like at home, Big Ronnie kept Butch on a short leash and refused to let him stand up for himself the way he was told to do Mm -hmm. at school. Mm Mm-hmm. Exactly. So I'm on the right track. That's good. As Butch turns into a teen, he gets bigger and stronger, and he's no longer a sitting duck for his dad's abuse. And these two start fighting a lot, and their shouting matches often turned into boxing matches. Oh, wow. And it didn't take much to set Big Ronnie off. That's what I have in my notes. No, I mean, there's the least little thing that was wrong when he drove up that driveway and saw anything out of line with the property that Butch hadn't done. He was ready to go when he got in the house. Okay. Mm. Even though Big Ronnie and Butch would fight a lot, and that doesn't seem odd to them, Ronnie and Louise think that there's something up with Butch. It could be years of abuse coming back to haunt them. Who could say? But Ronnie and Louise arranged for Butch to see a psychiatrist. Yeah, I felt like uh, what I channeled was that the only way for him to escape the abuse was to become withdrawn and to try to remove himself from the property. But I also got a lot of uh, chemical abuse and specifically needles. Yeah. They were showing me lots of needles. Yep. And he's unable to escape most of the time, but sometimes... Uh, he can escape from the situation. Mm. Yeah, I I have that as well. He did end up having a drug problem. 
he he sort of with his therapist he he was very um passive aggressive and said i don't need help there's nothing wrong with me leave me alone so what his parents do instead is that they decide if they can't get him to behave they're going to placate him so they start buying butch anything he wants they give mm. him money when he's 14 big ronnie gives him a $14,000 speedboat so he can cruise up and down the amityville river and i'm wondering is this to launder money and is it not for him at all now that you're telling me all this stuff? Mm-hmm. Well, it, it's a it's a license to continue abuse, too. Oh, OK. That makes sense. Hmm. Yeah. And around this time when he's 14, Butch begins to use amphetamines and that helps him to lose weight. Mm-hmm. But I read that whenever Butch wanted something, he just asked for it and it was his. If he wanted money, they would give it to him. And if they didn't give it to him, he would take it. He would just steal it from his parents. Oh, wow. At 17, he's kicked out of school, and he had moved on from doing speed and using heroin oh, and LSD. That's the needles. So there it is. There are yep. your needles. Okay. Yep. Butch fights with Big Ronnie. These two would go at it, and Butch's bad behavior was starting to spill over into his friend group. So I read on one account, there was an afternoon he's out on a hunting trip with some of his friends. He points a loaded rifle at a member of their group. It was a guy wow. he'd known for years. Mm-hmm. and. He does it with a blank expression on his face. All the blood drains from the other kid's face, and he runs away. And then later when the group is back together again, Butch asks him, why'd you leave so soon? (laughs) Like nothing had happened at all. Oh, no reason. Well, this is stuff that he's learned at home. From his dad, exactly. When Butch turns 18, his grandfather gives him a job at the car dealership. Butch told everyone that the position was gravy. It was easy. And because his grandfather owned the place and his father worked there, no one really expected much of him. Mm. And whatever those expectations were, he worked even less. So part of my channeling that I got on that was that the personality of this person is extremely negative due to the abuse And there's a feeling of no hope and unworthy feelings that are dominating, sort of apathetic, like, wow, I I can't even try to do anything because it's going to come out wrong. Yeah, no matter what I I do. Yeah, I don't do anything. I'm not going to do anything, you know? Wow. Well, they gave him a cash allowance at the end of each week. He used it for his cars which his parents also purchased for him. And he used it for booze and for drugs Mm -hmm. and for heroin. Mm -hmm. And with more and more drug use, Butch and Big Ronnie are getting into more and more fights. And one night, a fight breaks out between Big Ronnie and wife Louise. And Butch thinks he's going to settle this. And he brings out a 12-gauge shotgun from his room. He loads a shell into the chamber. He charges downstairs to the scene of the fight. Butch apparently says nothing but points the shotgun in his father's face and yells, quote, leave that woman alone. I'm going to kill you, you fat f-. Wow. This is it. Oh, man. But wow. he did not pull the trigger. And with that, Butch pulled the trigger, but the gun didn't go off. Oh. Mm-hmm. And when it doesn't, what do you think Butch does? He just very calmly lowers the gun and walks away with complete <laughs> indifference. Wow. Man. Wow. So maybe he didn't pull it. If you're saying he didn't, my research just said that he he pulled the gun and it didn't go off. So I'm getting that he didn't. He didn't pull the trigger. Okay. See, I would go by you as opposed to <laughs> someone who's trying to, like, you know, glean all this from research. Because right. the one thing I have learned in researching cases is that one person paints it one way and mm-hmm. another person paints it another way. And it's mm-hmm. re- the, the truth is always in the middle there somewhere. Mm-hmm. So the relationship, obviously, between Butch and Big Ronnie is turbulent at best. And in the fall of 1974, Butch wasn't happy with the money he was making for basically doing nothing. And by the end of October, he'd come up with a plan to steal money from his family. Oh, great. Around the 1st of November, Butch was given the responsibility of making a bank deposit for the car dealership. Now, whoever thought this was a good idea, I don't know. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. But he's supposed to deposit $1,800 in cash and $20,000 in checks, like cashier's checks. And instead, Butch arranges to be robbed. Robbed. I've got my air quotes up. (laughs) Robbed with help. Robbed (laughs) on his way to the bank by another slacker from the car dealership. And the two of them would split the money later. That's the plan. Ding, ding, ding. They're not too bright, obviously, because this is the plan. So these two geniuses leave the car dealership at 1230. They go to the bank. 
They don't return for another two hours. And when they do, they tell everyone that they were robbed at gunpoint while waiting at a red light. And Big Ronnie loses his shit. He's furious. <laughs> he takes it out on the employee at the dealership who gave the deposit to Butch in the first place. Because you mm-hmm. know how you were saying he places the blame. Mm-hmm. Well, he's mad at the guy who even allowed this to happen. Mm-hmm. They call the police. And when they show up, they want to talk to Butch. But instead of sticking to his story and pretending to be robbed, he gets irritated with the cops. And then he does what Butch does best. He gets violent like his dad. Mm-hmm. So much so that the police are like, this dude is lying his Mm -hmm. ass off Mm -hmm. so they start asking him about the two hours he was away after the robbery where did he go why didn't you come back to the dealership and butch yells quote you to the cops (laughs) and he bangs his hands on the hood of a car at his grandfather's dealership and the police back off but big ronnie smells a rat he knows his son is up to something yeah On Friday, November 8th, 1974, the police ask Butch to come down to the station so he can take a look at some mug shots, telling him they'd like him to help identify the thief. And at first, Butch is like, yeah, I'll come down, take a look. And then at the last minute, he backs out. And when Big Ronnie catches wind of this, he confronts Butch and demands to know why he's not cooperating with the police. And Big Ronnie yells at him, quote, You've got the devil on your back, end quote. Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) And Butch yells back, quote, you fat prick, I'll kill you, end quote. Wow. Then Butch runs out to his car, speeds away, and this is where our story goes south. Hmm. Thursday, November 13th, 1974. It's the middle of the night around 3 a.m. The DeFeos have gone to bed, all except Butch. Butch sat in his room. He's 23 years old at this point. He's in his private room. Butch is storing some guns. He would use them to hunt and he would sell them from time to time. On this night, November 13th, Butch selects a 35 caliber Marlin rifle from his closet and walks to his parents' master bedroom. He pushes aside the door to their room and stands over their bed as they sleep. Then he raises the rifle to his shoulder and pulls the trigger. The first shot is into Big Ronnie's back. The blast tore through his kidney and exited through his chest. He fires again, piercing the base of Big Ronnie's spine, leaving the bullet lodged in his father's neck. Jeez. At this point, his mother, Louise, is awake, because how could you not be awake? But she has seconds before Butch fires the gun at her. She's face down when her son fires two shots into her body, shattering her rib cage and collapsing her right lung. His parents are dead now. They're lying in pools of blood on the mattress. Well, no, <laughs> I got some quite different in my channel. All right, tell me. <laughs> um, I feel like there were more people involved. I don't feel like... Butch had enough wherewithal to mm-hmm. do this himself because of the years of abuse and the apathy, and he let everything else dominate him. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like he had the direction to just go in and shoot. And I feel like he had some kind of help. I do feel like he, there were two male, one female. And that um, they were all, the family was all shot while they were awake. And they were instructed to lay on their stomachs. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So hold that thought. Okay. Because you're, you're <laughs> saying exactly what others have said. Okay. Exactly what others have said. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm going to move on to the next room. He's going to go to the next room. Okay. okay. The hairs are on. On the, the back of your neck are standing up? Yeah, pretty much. Butch then calmly enters the room of Mark, age 12, and John Matthew, age 9. This room was apparently decorated with clipper ships and cannons and eagles on the wallpaper. Their dressers are filled with figurines of Catholic saints, and on the floor are tennis shoes and toys, because it's the little boy's room. Mm -hmm. Next to Mark's bed is a set of crutches and a wheelchair. Mark had recently suffered a football injury, and he had the wheelchair and crutches to help him get around. Now, for some reason, the only one who hears the gunfire at night, as far as we know, is the family dog Shaggy. But you're saying that that's not true, and there are going to be other people who say that as well. Mm -hmm. He's tied up outside to the boathouse. 
But when Butch stands between the twin beds of his brothers, he wastes no time. He fires one shot into each of them as they lay sleeping. Mark is killed instantly while John Matthew's spinal cord is severed by the shot, and he twitches for a few moments before finally dying. Butch isn't done. He then goes to his little sister's room. The last two rooms in the house are where his sister Dawn and sister Allison slept. Dawn was older than Allison. She's 18. Her little sister Allison's 13. And when Butch enters Allison's room, she wakes up and looks at him. Just as he lowers the gun to her face, he pulls the trigger and she dies instantly. Wow. Then he goes upstairs to the finished third floor attic. He aims the gun at Dawn's head as she is asleep in her bed and literally blows the left side of her face off. Jeez. So the girls got it in the face and everybody else got Got it it in the back. Yeah. Butch had begun murdering his family around 3 a.m. And by 3.15, he was finished. Butch cleans himself up. He calmly showers. He trims his beard, dresses in jeans and his work boots. And then he goes about collecting his bloody clothes and the rifle. He wraps them all up in a pillowcase just hours before sunrise. Then he drives from the suburbs of Amityville into Brooklyn and disposes of the pillowcase and all that's inside in a storm drain. Then he goes to work at his grandfather's Buick dealership. He arrives at work for business as usual. It's 6 a.m. in the morning. Mm. Now, that is odd because he didn't come in at 6 in the morning. That's right. He's Mm. in a drug stupor till, what, 10 or 11? Exactly. (laughs) When the sun gets warm. (laughs) Yeah. But Butch doesn't stay at work long. He calls home several times because his father isn't showing up for work. And when he acts like he's got nothing to do and he's bored, he leaves the dealership around noon and he calls his girlfriend, Sherry Klein, to let her know that he's going to be home early from work and that he wanted to stop by and see her. Then on his way back to Amityville from Brooklyn, he passes his buddy, Bobby Kelsky, and these two stop and chat, and then Butch goes on to Sherry's house, arriving around 1.30 p.m. Sherry's 19. She's a waitress at one of the bars where Butch liked to hang out. But when he makes it to Sherry's place, he casually mentions that he's tried to call home a bunch, and even though all the family cars are in the driveway, no one is answering. Mm -hmm. And to demonstrate this, Butch picks up the phone at Sherry's, calls home, and tries to get someone on the line at 110 Ocean Avenue. Yeah, to have an alibi. Alibi. He's trying Mm -hmm. to say, I was trying to find him, but nobody would answer the phone. He doesn't act overly concerned, only confused. He takes Sherry shopping at the mall in Massapequa, and then they drive to his friend Bobby's house. When they get there, Butch again says that his family looks like their home, cars in the driveway, blah, 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 but no one is answering the phone. And he says to Bobby, quote, there's something going on over there. The cars are all in the driveway, and I still can't get in the house. I called the house twice, and nobody answered, end quote. Then he switches gears and chats about plans for the night. Is Bobby going out later? Bobby tells Butch he's going to take a nap, and if he wanted to meet him out later on at this bar called Henry's, a local bar, that they could do that around 6 p.m. Hmm. Butch spends the rest of his day drinking with friends and shooting heroin. Oh, boy, oh, what nice. fun. Um, <laughs> he finally shows up at the bar, Henry's, sometime after 6, and Bobby showed up shortly after. And again, Butch talks about how he can't get in touch with anybody at his house. And he tells his friends, quote, I'm going to have to go home and break a window to get in. And Bobby says, quote, do what you got to do, man. Go do what you got to do. <laughs> And Butch leaves the bar, and then he returns a few minutes later, agitated and shocked. Quote, Bob, you got to help me. Someone shot my mother and father. End Hmm. quote. Wow. So Butch and Bobby. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. need to call the police. Acting 101. He (laughs) did not call the police. That's right. He comes back to the bar. Yeah. I need help. So Butch and Bobby and a slew of the others pile into Butch's car and Bobby drives. It's been 15 hours since Butch murdered his family. And when they arrive, Bobby Kelsky goes through the front door, races up to the master bedroom because Bobby knows this house. He's been there plenty of times. Mm -hmm. He knows where the DeFeos sleep. When he goes inside, he finds Big Ronnie and Louise dead. Hmm. Ronnie is face down and in a pair of blue boxers. Louise is under a blanket. She's dead all the same. The mattresses are soaked in blood. And Bobby finds Butch outside the door of the master bedroom crying in shock and wailing in disbelief. Mm -mm. Another one of Butch's buddies, Joey Yeswit, finds the telephone in the kitchen and he calls police. And I have a copy of this transcript and I'll post it in the in-laws and outlaws. But 911 has come a long way since (laughs) 1974. I'll tell you that much. 
I mean, it was a lot of where are you? What's your name again? What's the phone number you're calling from? Oh and the kid on the other end is like, I don't know this number. I'm just in this house. There are <laughs> oh dead bodies in this God. house. And finally, the 911 operator hands off the phone to a policeman, and he finally understands that people are dead and that Joey is calling from inside the house. He's mm. like, we're at one, we're in Ocean Avenue. Just get here. Wow. Mm. So within 10 minutes, the first officer is on the scene. His name is Kenneth Jaguski. And when he pulls up, he finds Butch's friends on the front lawn. Butch is with them, and he's crying uncontrollably. And as Officer Jaguski approaches the group, Butch says, quote, my mother and father are dead, end Hmm. quote. Hmm. Jaguski enters the house and goes straight upstairs. That's got to be a Polish name, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's (laughs) obvious. (laughs) We got all the Italians and the Polish name. I'm trying to get them right, everybody. But he goes into the house, goes straight upstairs, and first he finds Big Ronnie and Louise, and then he finds Mark and John Matthew. Then he goes back downstairs to use the phone in the kitchen to call the Amityville Police Headquarters. Butch is sitting at the kitchen table. He's crying as he listens to the officer's description of what's happened. And while he's listening, he offers up, I also have two sisters. Ding, ding. Hmm. Could you please go upstairs? <laughs> yeah, right? can somebody, yeah. There's more dead bodies, you just haven't found them. That's what he's saying. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah. So Officer Jaguski runs back upstairs, and another police officer arrives. His name is Edwin Tyndale, and together, these two find Dawn and Allison. Hmm. Now, by 7 p.m. that night, the neighborhood is all a titter. They, there'd been a murder at High Hopes. The police are filing in and out of the house. The neighbors are on their lawns gawking. Mm-hmm. Suffolk County Police Detective Gaspar Randazu was the first to question Butch. Detective Randazu asks Butch, who could have done such a thing? And Butch says, Louis Fellini. The mob thing. Fellini was a mafia hitman. Yeah. One that Butch claimed held a grudge against his family because of an argument a few years back. Here come the mafia ties. Mm -hmm. Okay. As the house is an active crime scene, the officers kindly ask the neighbor, his name is Rufus Ireland, if they can set up a command at his house. I've seen an interview with this guy. He was like, yeah, sure, y'all come Come on on over. We got coffee. There's beer in the refrigerator. It was kind of like that, seriously. And the police are worried that if it was a mob hit, that Butch could be in danger. Mm -hmm. He could still be a target, so they decide it's safest if they take Butch down to police headquarters where they can question him. Right. Now, by the time that takes place, the crew has been joined by Detective Joseph Napolitano, and it's then that Butch makes his written statement. And here it is. I was home the night before. I stayed up until 2 a.m. watching a movie called Castle Keep on TV at 4 a.m., I walked past the upstairs bathroom. I saw my brother's wheelchair in the front door. He tells police that he then heard the toilet flush because he couldn't sleep. He decided to go into work early. He tells police that he left work early, visited with Sherry and Bobby where he had a few drinks, tried to call his family at home, but no one answered. He finally returned home to check on them. And when he entered the house through a kitchen window, he went upstairs where he found his parents' bodies. After that, he raced back downstairs and hurried back to Harry's bar where he rounded up some of his friends and then they called police. Now, after Butch submits this signed statement, the detectives continue to question him about his family, about his suggestion that Louis Fellini might be the killer. And Butch replied that Fellini had lived with him for a short period of time. And during that time, he had helped Butch and his father carve out a hiding place in the basement where Ronald Sr. kept a stash of gems and cash. Oh, wow. That's probably true. (laughs) His argument with Fellini had stemmed from an incident where Fellini criticized some work that Butch had done at the auto dealership. Butch also voluntarily confessed to being a casual user of heroin. Oh, boy. Casual. Imagine that. Yeah. (laughs) As well as to the fact that he had set one of his dad's boats on fire so that Big Ronnie could collect on an insurance claim rather than paying for the motor. Uh, That's probably true, too. (laughs) Yeah, which Butch had originally damaged. Mm -mm Mm-mm-mm. Around 3 a.m., the detectives had finished their questioning, and Butch went to sleep on a cot in a back room. Butch seemed to be very cooperative. He was a cooperative witness, and the detectives didn't have any reason to suspect him or to hold him. Meanwhile, back at 112 Ocean Avenue, the murder investigation is ramping up. 
Mind you, it's only 1974. They obviously didn't have the technology, but they did have crack detectives and coroners, and they're looking at everything at the lab from the crime scene. And two days after the murder, Detective John Shervel was making one last sweep through the crime scene at 2.30 in the morning. I've seen an interview with him. He says he was totally creeped out walking oh, through this who house. Yeah. At 2.30 in the morning, he was the only officer there, and he decided, I'm going to do one last sweep. He Can goes, you imagine the trauma imprint in that In the house? Wow. Yeah, yeah oh. no. So he goes to the rooms where the murders had taken place, basically every room with the exception of Butch's. And all those rooms had been searched thoroughly, but Detective Shervel decides he's going to go into Butch's room and look around. Mm. Because it had been given a once-over, but he was like, you know what, I'm just, I'm just going to, his spidey senses, something told him, just go in there and check it out one more time. Mm-hmm. And when he goes into Butch's room, he sees a pair of rectangular cardboard boxes in the shadows in the corner of the room. And on the outside, they're labeled Marlin, 22 caliber, and 35 caliber. <laughs> and at this moment, the detective is not aware that the murder weapon has been determined by autopsy to be a 35 caliber Marlin rifle. So he well. takes the boxes. He just takes the boxes, puts them under his arm, well. throws them in the back of his cruiser. And he's like, yeah, I don't know if this is anything, but I'm going to take it with me. <laughs> yeah. And when he gets to police headquarters, he finds out about the 35 caliber Marlin being the murder weapon. Wow. He looks like the smartest guy at, at HQ. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> now, police have been questioning Butch's buddies, and when they press Bobby Kelsky a little bit, he tells him that Butch is a gun fanatic and that he had staged the robbery that they were investigating involving the Buick dealership, the cash and checks. Bobby, sing, he sings like a canary. He's like, nah, this is too close <laughs> yeah. for me. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. This is what happened. Mm -hmm. And police are thinking, well, if he's capable of that, is Butch playing us? Is he our suspect? Is he the type of person who could murder his entire family in cold ding, blood? Ding, ding. And remember, he's asleep at the police station. They wake him up at 845 the next morning. And the first thing Butch says is, quote, did you find Fellini yet? End quote. And instead of answering that question, Detective George Harrison, no relation to the Beatles, oh. reads him his rights. <laughs> and Butch loses his damn mind and says, I've been cooperative. It's not necessary to read me my Miranda rights. Mm, and, mm -hmm. and he even waived his right to an attorney because he wants them to know, that I am innocent. innocent. Right. I'm has innocent. nothing to do with this. <laughs> nothing to see here. Yeah, move along. Now, then, in my telling, I did get that he, he was not the... One who directed everything, like his persona is, is beaten down and apathetic, and he's not... He's not a leader. He's, he's a follower. He's not a leader. He's not one to go in and go bam, bam, bam. Mm -hmm. you yeah. Know? So he has to be told what to do. You know, he can't even work because he's so apathetic, so... Well, I think he was. I think he was told what to do. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting that you came up with that because there are some theories, and I think you're spot on. Detectives Robert Dunn and Dennis Rafferty take over, and Rafferty rereads him his rights, and then starts to question Butch: Where were you yesterday? What were you doing? What were you doing the day before? The night before? And then Detective Rafferty starts to focus on information from Butch's own statement. And Butch apparently supposes that his family is murdered sometime the next day. He tells them that it happened around like one o'clock in the afternoon. And when detectives say, mm, that doesn't hold water because everybody was found in their pajamas or their underwear. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's at this point that Butch's story starts to crumble like the last stale cookie in the jar. <laughs> the detectives say this crime actually took place between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., according to the autopsy results. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't have seen your little brother at 4 a.m., and they weren't murdered in the afternoon. And he's already told him that he was home during that time frame. So police are saying to him, we know you were home when the murders took place. So Butch changes his story, and he's going to do this a lot over the next few days <laughs> and the next few weeks mm -hmm. and the next few months and even the next few years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Creative license. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> he tells them, okay, I was there when the murders took place, but he had only been in each bedroom after his family was murdered. Police don't okay. buy it. And Detective Rafferty says, Butch, it's incredible. 
We have a 35 caliber gun box from your room. Every one of the victims has been shot with a 35 caliber. There has to be more to it. It's your gun that was used. Mm -hmm. And now Butch is desperate, but he just keeps on digging his own grave. He told his interrogators that at 3.30 a.m., Louis Fellini woke him up. And put a revolver to his head. <laughs> oh, my Here God. Here we go. Uh, another, another guy was in the room, too, according to Butch. Uh-huh. But when they press him about it, he could not provide any kind of physical description for the police. And according to Butch's new version of events, Fellini and the other guy led Butch from room to room, murdering each one of his family members. The police let Butch keep talking, and eventually he implicates himself when he tells them how he gathered and then discarded evidence from the crime scene. Oh. And then Detective Rafferty is like, hold the phone. Hmm. Wait a minute. Why did you pick up the cartridge if you had nothing to do with it? You didn't know it was your gun that was used? Like, you're saying you were there, but you were only there afterwards, but yet you're cleaning up? The crime scene, yeah. which makes sense and falls in line with your whole thing. He's a follower mm -hmm. and not a leader. Mm -hmm. So Butch didn't respond to the question. And the investigators allow him to talk some more because he's just digging his own grave. And they'd already mined a good deal of evidence implicating Butch and all the while pretending to believe that Fellini and his accomplice had taken Butch along on their killing spree while sparing his life alone. And once they'd been given a solid description of how the murders took place, they went in for the kill. Yeah, he was an easy mark. He yeah. was. And they say, quote, they must have made you a piece of it. That's what they say to Butch. Mm. They must have made you shoot at least one of them or some of them. And at this point, Butch is speechless. And Detective Rafferty says, quote, it didn't happen that way, did it? And Butch, who is now has his head in his hands, says, quote, Give me a minute. Yeah. He's yeah. like trying to pull it all together in his head. He is scrapping. And police say, Butch, they were never there, were they? Fellini and the other guy were never there. And Butch confesses, quote, no, it all started so fast. Once I started, I just couldn't stop. It went so fast. Oh, wow. End quote. Mm -hmm. And there it is. That's the confession that they wanted. Wow. Now, we're going to come back to this in a bit, okay? Because Cat, mm. I think, is... I feel like that they were all awake when they were shot, and they were instructed to lay on their stomachs because they didn't want to look at their face. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they were shot pretty much simultaneously in different rooms. Mm -hmm. Because how could you not... Yeah, you hear all of that. You, you You're going to hear that gun in the next right. room. You're going to yeah, get that's up. True. Right. Yeah. But so I feel like they were all shot yep. at the same time. Even a little 22 caliber in a home. Yeah. You're going to hear that. I've a gun is loud. Life. I've yeah. shot all my yeah. life. You're Listen, I wake up that. when I hear mm -hmm. the ice machine take off. <laughs> yeah. But but, yeah. Gun, but guns are loud. I yeah. mean, there's a yeah. reason you wear, you know, protective ear exactly. stuff. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. a reason why police officers go deaf. I mean, yeah. they have hearing yeah. problems after being on the force for a long time. Right. Sure. That's why. Mm -hmm. Sure. So he's taken into custody. He's held without bail at his indictment on Monday, November 18th. The grand jury hears this case. And when he comes to court, he's dejected. He says nothing. His confession is read out loud. Quote, I took the rifle and ammunition from my room. Then I shot my brother Mark like this, end quote. I mean, they're just reading straight from his, mm -hmm. his confession. Hmm. And Butch's attorney at the time, Leonard Simons, asked the judge for an immediate psychiatric examination saying that his client was depressed. And the judge replied, quote, under similar circumstances, I would be depressed too, end quote. <laughs> I like this judge. I know. The judge turns down the request for a psych eval, but agreed to have him looked at by a county physician because he had swollen lips and a bruise over his left eye. Hmm. We're going to come back to that hmm. because the police did beat him. Oh, wow. Hmm. So did he give a real confession? I mean, if if he's being coerced and they're beating him, and did the mob have connections inside the police force? But see, that's the conditioned reaction. I think, like when his dad beat him, he would eventually give in and let him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's that's ap apathetic, uh, and so if the police beat him, he was probably okay. You I'm got used the to confession. This. Yeah. You yeah. Know. I give. 
Mm-hmm. Right. But four days after the murder, Ronald DeFeo Jr. is in front of the grand jury being indicted for six counts of murder and criminal possession of a weapon, the 35 caliber Marlin rifle, which a dive team actually found in Amityville Creek about a mile from the DeFeo's house. Oh, wow. oh interesting. Ronald Jr. told them where to find it. He's held without bail, so he's just stuck there. Then his defense attorney, Leonard Simons, withdraws from the case. Ooh. There's hmm. no information on why, how, what was going on, but he is just out. He probably told him the truth and he couldn't handle it. Maybe, but he's like, I'm out. And while Butch is being indicted by a grand jury, the funeral mass for his family is taking place at St. Martin of Tours Church in Amityville. More than 800 people came to the funeral. And another 300 people waited outside the church. Hmm. The hour-long service was conducted by Father James McNamara, but he was joined by 10 other priests. Oh, wow. This is well, a really they needed re- it. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. a really religious family. And the others were from parishes in Brooklyn that the couple knew from growing up and living there so long. Mm. 10, 11 priests total. Wow. wow. That's a lot. That's, That's a lot of priests. Yeah. I realize that there are a lot of bodies, but that's a lot of priests. Butch's trial begins a year later on October 14th, 1975. Gerald Sullivan is the assistant district attorney with Suffolk County, New York, and he's the man who's determined to put Butch behind bars. And despite (laughs) Butch's confession, despite the fact that he'd been able to lead the investigators to the exact spot where he had disposed the evidence, and despite the fact that Butch's 35 caliber rifle was positively ID'd as the murder weapon, Sullivan took no chances in his approach to prosecute Ronald DeFeo Jr. And during the period of pretrial interviews and jury selection, Sullivan studied Butch. He questioned him. He observed how he behaved and interacted with others. And he thought that Butch was evasive and a pathological liar. Uh Uh-oh. Of course. (laughs) Now, Butch's new defense attorney is a man named William Weber. And Butch's pattern of behavior before the murders is going to give Weber the opportunity to plead innocence by reason of insanity on his client's behalf. But D.A. Sullivan knew that Butch DeFeo was not crazy and indeed a violent and cold-blooded killer, and he's determined to put him away for good. He wants the jury to see Butch as a sane, methodical murderer. Mm-mm-mm. Okay. So the question of Butch's mental state at the time of the murders would remain the defining piece of evidence upon which his acquittal or conviction would rest. And prior to the trial, Weber had shrewdly attempted to have the case dismissed outright, alleging that Butch had been refused access to counsel right before the police took his confession. Hmm. So trying to get him off on a technicality. Right. He further contended that the confession itself was obtained under duress, the product of physical abuse on the part of the police. Mm-hmm. So where they beat him up. Yeah. yeah. Neither of these claims stood up under scrutiny, and William Weber was left to defend Butch's actions on the grounds that he was legally insane at the time that the murders took place. But is that enough to convince a jury? So D.A. Sullivan called a number of witnesses, including police officers and detectives who'd worked the case and assorted relatives and friends of Butch's. And through their testimony, he wants to show the jury a man who was capable of murdering six defenseless family members. And his star witness is Butch himself. Oh, wow. Interesting. But when defense attorney William Weber calls Butch to the stand, he holds a picture of his dead mother in her bed in his hand, and Weber asks him, quote, Ronnie, that's your mother, isn't it? And Butch responds, no, sir. Quote, I told you before, and I'll say it again, I never saw this person before in my life. I don't know who this person is, end quote. Because that's what was in the script. Yeah, maybe. (laughs) Maybe. So Weber proceeded to show Butch a photo of his father's body and asked Butch, quote, Butch, did you kill your father? And he replies, quote, did I kill him? I killed them all. Yes, sir. I killed them all in (laughs) self-defense. Evasive. The prosecution, I read, wore poker faces while some of the members of the jury gasped out loud at Butch's courtroom confession, and Weber continued unfazed asking why Butch had done such a thing. And here's what Butch says, quote, 
As far as I'm concerned, if I didn't kill my family, they were going to kill me. Mm. And as far as I'm concerned, what I did was self-defense, and there was nothing wrong with it. When I got a gun in my hand, there's no doubt in my mind who I am. I am God, (laughs) end quote. (laughs) Okay, so on my channeling, I did get that he was in a scenario. This entity is in a rat-in-the-corner scenario. Yeah. Yeah. To where there's no escape. Mm -hmm. I also got that I felt like he shot the mother, not his dad, Mm -hmm. because she she watched everything happen and didn't stop it. Mm. And so I think that his anger towards her was more than towards the father because he was... She didn't protect him. Right. And so I feel like his anger escalated towards her more than than, interesting than the father. Okay, interesting. So after he gives this confession, the jury members have to think this guy's one brick shy of a load. (laughs) Obviously, he's deranged, lunatic, someone with fleeting with a fleeting grasp on reality. And it was precisely this possibility, the possibility that Butch could escape judgment by duping the jury into thinking he's nuts, that the D.A. Sullivan had worked the hardest to prevent. That was what he didn't want to happen. And that's exactly what did happen. Mm hmm. And William Weber claimed that Butch DeFeo killed his family in self-defense because he heard their voices plotting against him. Mm. The insanity plea was supported by the psychiatrist for the defense, Daniel Schwartz, and the psychiatrist for the prosecution, Dr. Harold Zolan, maintained that although Butch was a user of heroin and LSD, he had antisocial personality disorder and was very aware of his actions at the time of the crime. The trial's judge... Thomas Stark declared that Butch's crimes were, quote, the most heinous murders committed in Suffolk County since its founding, end quote. I don't doubt it. And the prosecution wasted no time in taking him apart in cross-examination. He ridiculed Butch's seeming inability to remember who his own mother was. He exposed inconsistencies between his testimony and the statement he gave police on the night of the crime. But most of all, D.A. Sullivan pushed Butch's buttons. He rattled him. He goaded him. He goaded his arrogance and and his hatred, and prosecution wanted the jury to see that rather than a victim of insanity. Mm -hmm. And Ronnie Butch DeFeo Jr. was a lucid, devious, cold-blooded killer. That's his Mm -hmm. message to the jury. Right. The DA's questions begin to center around the murders themselves and the twisted sense of enjoyment Butch got from killing his entire family. Quote, you felt good at the time, he asked. And this is how Butch responds, quote, yes, sir, I believe it felt very good. Wow. And then the DA says, is that because you knew they were dead because you had given them each two shots? And Butch replies, I don't know why. I can't answer that honestly. Okay, so I did get something on that. Okay, (laughs) okay. (laughs) And I think that this is why he kind of made it so easy for them to convict him is This is the only achievement that he has in his life. (gasps) It's the only thing that he's actually achieved, albeit a a horrible thing. Yeah. But for him, it stands out and it gleans attention, which he has never had, you see. Oh, my gosh. It's so interesting that you say that because the DA said, quote, do you remember being glad? And Butch said, quote, I don't remember being glad. I remember feeling very good, good. And Sullivan kept pushing him until Butch yelled out in court, quote, you think I'm playing? If I had any sense, which I don't, I'd come down there and kill you now, end wow. quote. Wow. Right, because, I mean, <laughs> at this point in his life, he has seen that what he did has Gained him attention. Attention, yeah. And it, this is this is his stage, so right. he used it. Right. Yeah, interesting. Yep. Mm-hmm. There was testimony that Butch was in trouble with loan sharks, that he had huge fights with his dad, which we know is true, that he would lose his mind and shoot off a gun when the song I Shot the Sheriff by Eric Clapton came on the radio. <laughs> I won't hear that song the same And again. all I could think of was, that's some Eastern Kentucky stuff, wow. shooting off the gun when I Shot the Sheriff comes on. <laughs> Apparently, he was inspired. 
But here's the thing. Butch's maternal grandfather, Michael Brigante, he hired a man named Herman Race, who was a former New York City supervising police detective, to investigate the murders. They wanted an outside person. Mm -hmm. And Brigante had testified at trial that he did not feel that his grandson acted alone. Ah. Since Brigante did not feel that his grandson had done all that he was accused of, he wanted Race, a licensed investigator and friend, to either prove or disprove the case against his grandson, Butch. And Race eventually uncovered evidence, here we go, that showed there were multiple gunmen. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. And at least two guns used during the commission of the crime. Right. Aha. Uh-huh. During a private court hearing and at trial, racist findings were corroborated by the prosecutor and the medical examiner, who was astonished that one man sat accused of being the sole gunman. Uh-huh. Well, but he's an easy mark, so why go looking for anybody else? Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah, it's kind of like, wash your hands of this one, put yeah, it away. You on. know, yep. DeFeo Jr. is like, hey, I'm your man because I'm the center of attention. Yep. Now, despite District Attorney Sullivan's painstaking efforts, he knew that a guilty verdict was not a sure bet. He was rewarded for his skepticism when the jury's first vote came back 10-2 with two holdouts who were still uncertain about Butch's mental state at the time of the murders. Mm. After reviewing transcripts of Butch's testimony, the vote came back at a unanimous 12-0. On Friday, November 21st, 1975, Ronald DeFeo Jr. was found guilty of six counts of second-degree murder. Two weeks later, on December 4th, 1975, Judge Thomas Stark sentenced Butch to six consecutive sentences of 25 years to life for each victim. So 150 years. Mm. Hmm. Butch DeFeo was taken to the Sullivan Correctional Facility in the town of Fallsburg, New York, and incarcerated with the New York State Department of Corrections. Now, (laughs) years later, a man named Rick Osuna, who's the author of The Night the DeFeos Died, he interviewed Butch on November 30th, 2000, while he was in prison. And what Butch said was that he, along with his sister Dawn Ah. and Hmm. another friend, actually committed the murders of his parents and brothers and sisters. Wow. Okay, so I had got two you, male, one female. One female. There's your female. Mm-hmm. And they did it out of fear and desperation. And these are Rick's words and the details of the hours leading up to the six killings. The DeFeo household had been in a frenzied state during the evening of November 12th, 1974. Mm-hmm. Butch's father, according to Butch, routinely abused the entire family. And after that evening's tirade had settled down, Butch, his 18-year-old sister Dawn, and two of Butch's friends proceeded to get high in the basement. Yeah, okay. I, I felt like that uh, whatever he did in taking direction had to be chemically fueled yep. to because just he himself sober there's not enough will to carry out something like this right so, right uh, with chemical induction yep. you said that in the that beginning yeah comes out and he does what he has to do so here's why the daughter dawn is interested in getting rid of her dad She is mad because her dad is preventing her from joining her boyfriend in Florida. Oh, this wouldn't be the first case of that. (laughs) Yeah. So she wants to be with her boyfriend in Florida. She's worn out after years of physical abuse. Don DeFeo approached her older brother about killing their parents. And Butch initially refused. And after all the drugs and alcohol and desperation over the next few hours, Butch finally gave in to Don's request. Employing his two friends, Butch and Don left the safety of the family's basement and headed for their parents' bedroom on the second floor. It was around 1 a.m. on November 13, 1974, while one friend waited as a lookout. The other, with his Colt Python, followed Butch, who had armed himself with the thirty-five Marlin rifle. Hmm. A votive candle burning on the father's dresser, the second floor room bathroom light, and a military-style flashlight that was later recovered by the police on the brown recliner in the hallway outside of the master bedroom, that was their only light source. They did all of this in the dark. The parents were attacked while they lay in bed. Mr. DeFeo, however, was able to struggle to his feet to attempt a counterattack on his assassins, which makes sense because he is not face down. He's the only one who's not face down. A second bullet struck him in the head, dead, before he was able to reach his target. 
Luis DeFeo lay in bed, moaning for help, and as she slowly bled to death, a second bullet would silence her for good. Although the original plan called for the younger children to be taken to the grandparents' house in Brooklyn, Dawn, according to Butch, killed them to eliminate the children as witnesses and potential threats. Okay, wow. so in my channeling, right here on page two. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I did get that things don't go as planned, and circumstances star turn for the worse. Yeah, I don't. I didn't know what that was, but that seems to that seems to jive with that, doesn't you know, it? With, yeah, yeah, yeah. Butch claimed he was not in the house at the time of the children's murders, but chasing after one of his friends who had fled the scene in order to lure him back to assist with the cleanup. Mm. And even while feigning insanity at trial, Butch DeFeo never admitted to shooting the children. That's the one thing. He, he talked about shooting his mm-hmm. parents. He never said that he shot the kids. Right. Just that he shot them all. Yes. Yeah. Or killed them all. Right. Maybe with his decision to go through with it, he feels like that I killed them all by agreeing to it. Exactly. And he says... That when she enters, when Dawn enters Mark and John's room, when the big sister enters the room with the rifle, Dawn callously ordered the boys to face down. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. A clue that the DeFeos were awake at the time of the murders. Oh, yeah. And it was the final position of Mark DeFeo's body. Because Mark had suffered a debilitating injury from football, he was forced to sleep on his back. So he oh. wasn't asleep when he got shot. He right. was awake. She made him turn over and then shot him. Mm. Wow. So he was shot face down in the bed. Now, the next room Don entered was Allison's. Standing at the doorway, Don raised the rifle, taking aim as Allison slightly raised her head before looking into the muzzle flash. Death was instantaneous. The bullet impacted Allison's left cheek and exited her right ear. Wow. Mm. Allison's oh. wounds were meant to disfigure her. Hmm. Oh. Then Butch, upon his return, he's enraged at the senseless murders. He confronts his sister Dawn in her third floor bedroom, and after briefly wrestling for the gun, Butch gets the upper hand, slams Dawn against the bed, knocking her out. She was unconscious on her bed when Butch placed the back of the rifle to Dawn's head and fired. Wow. Mm-mm-mm. And the murderous spree had finally ended, but the cleanup had just begun. Jeez. Now, according to Rick Osuna, he tried to connect with the accomplices that were named by Butch. They are not named in this book. Mm -hmm. But one was rumored to be in a witness protection program. Mm. Well, that screams mob. Very curious. (laughs) And the other refused to be interviewed. And I believe that that one person that refused to be interviewed is now deceased. Mm. Mm. Now, the postmortem exam on Dawn did show that she had unburned powder on her nightgown, which could possibly mean that she did indeed fire a weapon. Oh, oh interesting. Mm-hmm. And the second bullet in Mom, Louise, didn't actually come from the rifle, but a handgun. And when they found the pillowcase with the rifle, there was a holster for a handgun. But no handgun. Hmm. Hmm. Now, in 2012, divers did find something that looked like a part of an old handgun. Same gun? Hard to know. I was going to say, it's, <laughs> handguns probably went where the gun, other gun went. Yeah. yeah. In, in the drink. But remember, none of them seemed as if they had struggled or even left their beds, just like you said. I feel like they were instructed. They were instructed to do so. Put your head in the pillow. And the rifle shot had to be loud. And the only one, again, the only one, according to neighbors, who seemed frazzled was the family dog outside, Shaggy. He was tied up. Hmm. He was waiting for the mystery van. (laughs) He was waiting for the mystery (laughs) machine. (laughs) The mystery mystery machine. machine. That's right. (laughs) And a year later... A new story is going to unfold about the house at 112 Ocean Avenue, and what will happen next will enthrall a nation, perplex psychics and mediums from all over the United States, and make a few people very, very rich. Mm. So join us next week for part two of The Real Amityville Horror. But for now, that's all I have to say about that. Hey, Hitch to Homicide listeners. 
This is psychic medium Katherine Kaufman. Since 1980, I've been investigating the paranormal and phenomena of spirits. She's being modest. Katherine Kaufman is one of, if not the foremost authority in the South on the paranormal. She's done thousands of readings with amazing outcomes, including readings for me. I'm a psychic medium, a paranormal blogger, and the host of a weekly live show, Monday Night Live in Lexington where we discuss the paranormal as well as self-help and psychic defense. And just so you know, all mediums are psychic, but not all psychics are mediums. Catherine is a rare gem who can read the energy around you and connect you to the loved ones who have passed. And on her weekly show, she delves into subjects such as dream interpretation, how to connect with your spirit guides, and unpacking the laws of attraction. And now, I'm also hitting the road to connect with others on these subjects and more. I'm now taking booking engagements and can speak at your next group, company, or corporate event, offering tips on how to de-stress, how to love again after your partner has passed, and even how to develop your own psychic abilities, which all of us have. Because yes, we all have them. Don't miss this chance to connect with Katherine for your next event. To book any service, go to KatherineKaufman.com. You can book and pay online. And the best part for our H2H listeners, you don't have to be in Kentucky for Katherine to perform a psychic reading, mediumship, remote viewing, or business counseling, because online sessions are available. Just go to KatherineKaufman.com. That's K-A-T-H-R-Y-N-K-A-U-F-F, as in Frank, M-A-N. And join me each Monday night on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for Monday Night Live in Lexington at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a live show about paranormal topics. That's KatherineKaufman.com. Run, don't walk. You don't want to miss this. Okay, well, that was a good one. <laughs> Can't wait for the next part. I hope everybody can sleep tonight yeah, after that. Exactly. Wait till we get to part two. I know. I know. Uh-huh. So tell tell me what's going on now. Well, it's time for you know what. It's a little bless your heart. Let's do it, and we have a guest bless your hearter today. Yep, I'm stepping <laughs> down for the time being. You're stepping down for the day. We got David stepping in. So I feel let's very honored. Let's right. do it. Here no, we go. No pressure. <laughs> Dateline, London, England, March 2022. A UK driver who was arrested for reckless driving had officers in stitches after producing a license from Legoland. (laughs) The fiasco began after officers attempted to pull over an Audi A7 they had observed maneuvering recklessly all over the road near Bexley. (laughs) However... The driver refused, resulting in a 35-mile chase that took them from southeast London to Kent. (laughs) Jeez. They were even forced to call in a police helicopter to aid in the pursuit. Wait, they had a helicopter. (laughs) They had the helicopter come in. Yeah, this is like big time. Okay. Big pursuit. Was this a Lego helicopter or a real one? (laughs) No, this is a real (laughs) helicopter. okay, Okay, okay. Just checking. Just checking. Eventually... The pursuing officers caught up with a knucklehead in Minster, Kent, after he ran out of gas. (laughs) Whereupon, they found a large stash of marijuana in the car. That was only the tip of the iceberg. When the officers asked for his driver's license, the 21-year-old male brandished a fake ID he'd received from (laughs) Legoland as a kid in 2003. (laughs) The award is gifted to children who pass the theme park's driving test, which entails using a brick-built electric car to navigate traffic lights, (laughs) roundabouts, Lego police, and a speed camera. (laughs) The cops joked that the Lego land license was not the reason for the driver's arrest. Dangerous driving... And the large amount of cannabis was. <laughs> Along with not having a bona fide driver's license, the Lego maniac also lacked insurance. Oh. Yeah, Got to have insurance. They don't give insurance that, at Legoland, yeah, apparently. Prob- probably not a, a very good uh, type of insurance anyway. <laughs> the miscreant was subsequently arrested at the scene on suspicion of dangerous driving, failing to stop, possession of a Class B drug, driving with no insurance, and driving without a license. He has reportedly been released on bail until September 1st, hopefully only riding a bicycle. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> made of Legos. Made, made of Legos. Made of Legos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you said that, I was like, uh, they only insured it for like four or five blocks. Yeah. Oh. Uh, 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 Shaggy, uh, yeah, yeah. She'll be here all week. I'll Try be the here all week. But um, bump. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you have a blessed your heart or you know someone whose heart needs to be blessed, send it over to us, Chris at hitchtohomicide.com. Yep. That's all we have this week. Thank you to Ms. Catherine Kaufman, Psychic Medium. All of her information will be in the show notes, but you can always go to katherinekaufman.com. Just make sure you spell it correctly. K-A-U-F-F-M-A-N. That's right. Two F's. Two F's. One M. <laughs> one M. <laughs> Two F's, one M, and you're in there. And thank you to David. Yes, nice job. He's going to be back for part two. We'll see you guys back for part two next week. That's my husband out there in the studio. And that's my beautiful bride. Join us next time on Hitch to Homicide. Bye, y'all. Bye, y'all. Bye.